So as you know, the the WPC, just for those who are not familiar with it, this was set up in 2006 uh, and was an attempt to bring together all the stakeholders in Parkinson's together. So that's not just the scientists and the clinician and the therapists, but people with Parkinson's and caregivers. Uh, and this has been a fantastically successful, uh, I would say, venture, bringing people together. And these research spotlights endeavour to do the same, if you like. So we like to ask one of our distinguished scientists a little bit about themselves so we can understand how they ended up in the field of Parkinson's and then like to discuss their research, what the research is, what the research is telling us and what that means for people with uh, Parkinson's. So it's an absolute delight to have Adrian uh, join us uh, today, who is uh, currently in the uh, south of France, whereas I'm in a wet uh, Cambridge in the UK. Uh, Adrian is a neuroscience researcher. He's going to tell us a lot about his life, but he's had 30 years experience working in uh, the bioscience area with companies. Uh, he was director of neurobiology at the Pierre Fabre. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, and senior scientist at Servia, which is a big and the pharma companies published over 200 papers. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, these drugs that work on the serotonin uh, system, uh, which is a system which has been indicating a lot of other disorders. But we'll come to that uh, in a little while. As Eli said, uh, do put your questions in the chat and I will endeavour to uh, get to those and try and bring them in uh, as I can uh, in our discussion. So welcome, Adrian. Uh, Thank you. To be I think with you. you had your first experience of the WPC last July. That's correct. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be there. Uh, and I was just uh, saying to, to Eli that this was the first time I had attended a, a WPC meeting. So it, it was a it was a revelation, actually. Um, you know, as a PhD researcher, I spent a lot of time uh, talking about laboratory experiments and uh, experimental models. So to be with uh, so many patients and carers that have direct experience of, of PD was really uh, uh, extremely enriching for me. Well, that's great. So I'm glad it was a good experience for you. It will be even better next time if that can be the if that can if that's possible. So Adrian, you're based in South France, but it, it doesn't sound like a French accent to me. So tell me. <laughs> where life began for you and, and you know, what your initial research was and how you got into research. Yeah, so, no, so I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, British and um, uh, I studied in, uh, in the UK. I did uh, my uh, bachelor's degree in, uh, in biochemistry. I was at the University of Kent at Canterbury. Um, and, I, and I stayed on at, uh, at that university to, to do a PhD. Uh, this was in um, Professor Philip Strange's laboratory at the university there. And uh, and then that's what really got me into, I was actually neuropharmacology. Okay, It was really drug actions um, in the neuroscience. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so your initial work was on sort of drugs and their effects in the brain? I mean, were you working on this serotonin, this 5-HT system then, or were you just anything that so, so, so this is uh, this uh, this is where my interest in serotonin began because okay. um, my PhD was actually on serotonin five HT one A receptors. So this is one of the the many receptor subtypes that serotonin interacts with, and uh, I actually did my PhD on that very same receptor. So that was um, back in the late eighties. I began, and I'm I still going to ask you when it was. I thought we would be polite and just say it was it was in the past. <laughs> It, it's 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 becoming like uh, big numbers now, yeah. But uh, I'm I'm still working on that same target, which is uh, which is pretty amazing actually. So so you started on it back in the eighties with your PhD, and you're still working on it now. So I mean, obviously, um, a lot of people will know about serotonin because serotonin has been associated with uh, depression, and so there's yeah. a, a lot of these selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which people take. I think uh, things like Prozac and and such like so. It might be useful just to start with. So, what? So, what is serotonin? What does it do? Uh, presumably, we all have serotonin. It's in our brain. It's doing all sorts of things. But in a nutshell, what, what's the sort of main function of serotonin? Yeah. Um, so, uh, the main function which people thought about, uh, certainly back in the eighties and nineties, 
was um, mood regulation. So it was anxiety and depression. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain. It's a, it's, it's one of um, a bunch of different uh, neurotransmitters. You know, obviously dopamine is one which we talk a lot about in the yeah. Parkinson's field, but there's obviously other ones like serotonin, uh, noradrenaline, uh, glutamate, etc. And serotonin is one of the these main neurotransmitters in the brain. And uh, uh, it's been very, very strongly um, associated with mood regulation. Um, yeah. And certainly back in those days when I started uh, uh, my research, um, the big excitement was around 5-HT1A receptors and serotonin um, for uh, anxiety, for treating so, anxiety. So, so just so I've got it correct, so serotonin is a transmitter. It's a release from a nerve cell. It then acts through these different types of receptors and the different right. types of receptors are found in different places and have different functions right so so this this is where the story gets more complex than just uh anxiety or depression so so serotonin is released from serotonin neurons yeah. and, the, and these serotonin neurons um are located in particular brain regions which we call um the rafe nuclei so that, that's just below and, where the uh, dopamine cells are in parkinson's Right. Um, and from those um, particular nuclei, the the neurons project to several different brain regions. And uh, and therefore, depending on where they project to, they will influence different kinds of brain functions, and uh, including um, including mood. Um, and that's, that was the one which really attracted attention initially. But um, as time has gone by, um, there's been this increasing awareness that, in fact, serotonin has all kinds of additional um, effects in, on other uh, brain functions, including motor control, which is, of course, important for, for Parkinson's. And is that is that related to where 5-HT is released? So if it's released in a bit of the brain uh, associated with mood control, it's going to have an effect on mood. If, it, if it's released in the striatum where dopamine normally works, it'll have an effect on movement. Or is it more to do with the type of receptors it then binds to in these sites. So it, yeah, right. it's, it's, actually, it's actually both of those. So, yeah. um, so, so when serotonin is released, for example, in the frontal areas of the brain, so in the frontal cortex, um, that's very strongly associated with um, antidepressant effects. Um, yeah. But when serotonin is released in other brain regions, for example, in the in, in the striatum, which is one of the main brain regions associated with um, motor control, then uh, it has these important effects on uh, on, on movement, and uh, and that's what we've been. Um, this is kind of a, a story that's emerged over the last 10, 15 years very strongly, and it's kind of taken really a center stage um, in um, uh, in targeting the particular receptors that can influence movement in that brain region okay. um and, so, and that's where it came back to 5 hd one okay so perhaps i can come back to that in a minute because i'm quite interested with your phd you were you was you were particularly interested in this type of serotonin receptor but that was in the context of mood disturbances depression and anxiety that's right and, and so out of your phd how did that work evolve did you carry on working in the lab trying to better understand it and develop better drugs for depression or anxiety or so, so there was um, at that stage there was this drug called uh, busperone uh, which at that time was quite new it was uh, um, a drug developed by a company called Bristol Myers Squibb BMS um, and they developed busperone for treatment of anxiety um, it actually became a blockbuster drug uh, um, in, in those days um, yeah. So that attracted a lot of attention uh, to 5 t one a receptors. And um, so, so I, I was basically... So can I just ask, Adrian, up to that point, what have the drugs been targeting? They've been targeting different aspects of the serotonin for treating depression. So this was a new class of drug, was it, for depression? It was. So, um, so, so if at that stage, depression was basically being treated through um, SSRI. So this is uh, drugs like Prozac, okay? So we, yeah. we, we're looking at... Uh, fluoxetine, which is the the trade name, the uh, the uh, yeah. compound name of uh, of Prozac. Um, okay. So um, so those drugs for treating depression, also used for for treating anxiety, yeah, are, are drugs which regulate serotonin levels across the brain. So, so these are, let's say, very broadly acting 
compounds. Right. They, uh, they will modulate all of the serotonin level in all of the brain regions. So, so what happened with buspirin was that from modulating all of the serotonin levels everywhere, it then was a step towards a more precise targeting of one particular receptor subtype. Um, so I, sh I should say that serotonin acts through these receptors. So, so a receptor is basically a protein sitting on a neuron, yeah. um, which will detect a neurotransmitter. Yeah. So a bit like so, dopamine acts on dopamine receptors and dopamine agonists like pramipex exactly. or rapinrol, they all bind to dopamine receptors and work through that. So the serotonin binds to these receptors, and there are many types. And that protein, once it's bound serotonin, then mediates an effect in that cell. That's right. It triggers a response within the neuron, uh, which can then be transmitted further. Um, yeah. so, so there was a kind of a movement from these... Uh, SSRIs, these uh, Prozac type drugs, to to compounds which were more acting on particular receptors, and uh, and buspirin was a step on the way. Buspirin is an old drug; it's not particularly uh, active. Um, so, what um, various companies, including uh, companies I worked with at uh, Servier first, and then at uh, Pierre Fabre, um, there was this sort of search for improved drugs with more specificity, more potent, more active. And uh, um, and, and that's where my research led me. So you, so you finished your PhD in Kent. Yeah. And then you moved into pharma. Yes. And, and then in pharma, that's, that's where, you, and, and so you, so a lot of people sort of think of pharma as developing new drugs. And, and that was your sort of primary aim, was it, was to work on this, trying to find more selective drugs to work on this, this receptor. Uh, so that you could come up with better antidepressants. That was the sort of that was the strategy, right? So in fact, there was there was two strands. I, I I always wanted to go into industry. It was always my uh, my interest to say, right, I, I want to do applied research. I want I, I want all this knowledge that uh, that we generate to actually produce something that we can use, um, ultimately to benefit people um, and uh, and bring some sort of um, Therapeutic product to 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 the patients who need it. So so that was always my desire. And in uh, a survey and then at um, Pierre Fabre, th there were two strands to the kind of research we were doing. Uh, so the first one was this uh, antidepressant, anxiolytic mood modulation with these 5-HT1A drugs, and, and the other one was um, what was anxiolytic. Uh, sorry, was antipsychotics. Uh, and that's because um, so antipsychotics are the drugs which are used for people with schizophrenia and these major affected psychosis, diseases. hallucinations. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and th now those drugs, these antipsychotics, uh, there was a story there also uh, emerging at that time, which was um, to look for antipsychotics which had serotonin, 5-HT1A receptor activity. Because people suffering from, for example, schizophrenia yeah. um, also have mood problems and they have cognition problems. And the 5-HT1A drugs could benefit those symptoms for people suffering from, um, from schizophrenia, for example. Okay. So, so, so those were the two strands that we were working on. And, um, and in fact, it was this second strand, this... Um, antipsychotics strand that brought me gradually to the Parkinson's fields. Okay. Um, uh, and then that took a number of years, but that's that's where it came from. Okay. And uh, I mean, it's interesting that because obviously uh, some of the side effects of the medication and some of the clinical features of Parkinson's can lead people to develop hallucinations and uh, superficially aspects of their condition, which look a little bit like schizophrenia. So we'll come back to that because I'll be quite interested to hear your views on whether you're your new drugs around the 5-HT system may have some role to play in, in dealing with that aspect of it. I'm just curious that you thought pharma was a better way of bringing drugs to the to help people than staying in academia. And I could sort of see why, because in academia, you just do experiments, but you don't necessarily translate. But I could then say, well, in pharma, they're just after making drugs. They don't necessarily need to understand what's going on. But you felt <laughs> you felt this was the right environment for you to take your scientific Yes, I, 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 I would say that what you've just um, 
described is, is a real caricature of what really happens. All right. Um, yeah. You know, the, it, um, I don't think universities are ivory towers, and I don't think that uh, companies uh, are just all about, you know, synthesizing drugs and ignoring the science. Um, so it, it's it's far far more interlinked than that. And actually, I was a I was privileged all, all through my my research career to have a lot of interactions with with academia. And uh, in my experience, um, the academic researchers all, have all been very happy to interact with um, with pharmaceutical researchers as well. So, so this has really been a, a win win for both sides. Um, and that's definitely evolved much more, I would say. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've always accepted that, that, that there's been a degree of interactions, but I would say it's become much more common nowadays. In fact, it's very unusual for academia to be working without being cognizant of where it's going in terms of the clinic. And, and and I don't think any company works without trying to understand the basics and doing the science behind it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I I guess there might have been more of a, let's say, um, separation a few decades ago. But uh, I, I think where we are now is it, everybody understands we, we have to work together for this to, to, to bring new treatments to the clinic. Yeah, because I think it's important for people to hear that the sort of partnership that needs to take place mm. in order to translate translate this. So, uh, and do put your questions, uh, those who are online, uh, into the chat box. So, so you worked for these big companies. You're working on this 5-HT and this particular receptor and its role in depression, anxiety, and psychosis. Uh, but it, 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 you're now uh, with Neurolixis, as we can see in the little little symbol above you. With the nerve cells, <laughs> right. with, some, with some. So, so when did that come into existence? When did you move out of these other companies and find? Because you you are a co-founder of this company. This is your company, right? Right, that's right. So, um, so I was with um, uh, Servier for uh, for nine years. I was with um, Pierre Fabre uh, for nearly eight years, and um, and then back in uh, twenty eleven, um, I co-founded. Uh, Neurolixis with um, a good friend and colleague is uh, Mark Varney, um, who's uh, who's based in the US, and um, and that was really uh, at the time when uh, a lot of pharma companies, unfortunately, had decided that um, research into brain disorders was too long, too expensive, too complicated. Um, and that actually pulled out of neuroscience research. And uh, th this was a bit of a phenomenon across uh, quite a few pharmaceutical companies, unfortunately. And, um, uh, and, and Mark and I strongly believed that we were a very long way from resolving um, um, the pathologies of the brain, uh, including Parkinson's and others, uh, and there was still so much work to do that I mean, we, we were really excited about the opportunities that we, we think exist. Um, so we thought, well, we should just make a go of it. And uh, and therefore we found in your Alexis. OK, so there was a sort of perception in pharma that it's too difficult. It's just it's too much effort and it is failing. That was the sort of perception that, that, that was that was the case. Um, yeah. that, that was the perception. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it was a true perception, but that's that's how it was yeah. seen. Despite the fact um, we lived with an aging population where neurological diseases and disorders and was was going to increase. And of course, since COVID, particularly, you know, mental health issues have become a major, major global health problem. So you you made the brave decision to set up your own company, and and we will come to this sort of you know your discoveries and how this relates to aspects of Parkinson's and and dyskinesia. But I'm just quite interested to know you know because a lot of people they would not have set up a company. I mean, what it was like to set it up and get going, and then have your own line of research. I mean, was it a particularly easy path, or was it? Um... Uh, uh, no, it's been a it's been a battle. Um, it's been a battle uh, all through. Um, so I, I think. You know, looking back, it was um, several things coincided. So one was um, really we were passionate about research. We, we we love research, and it was a case of thinking: well, do we walk away from something we really love, mm -hmm. um, and 
maybe look back uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years later and say, mm -hmm. we should have tried. Yeah. Okay. We should have given it this go. Um, and so, so that was one thing. Um, so a kind of sense of, well, we don't want to give up yet. Yeah. Um, and another thing was, uh, and this is more specific to, to what we're now doing in New Alexis, is that we saw an opportunity uh, because this serotonin story was really being talked about um, increasingly in the Parkinson's area. Yeah. And so we thought we should really try and see where we can go with that. And those, in fact, we wrote a grant application. This was the first thing we did. This was back in uh, 2011, 2012. We wrote a grant application, which we sent to the Michael J. Fox Foundation to test some serotonin 5-HT1A compounds in models of Parkinson's disease. Okay. And um, to our pleasant um, surprise, even, uh, because we hadn't done this kind of thing before, uh, it, the grant application was immediately accepted. And we started doing experiments, and basically it worked, you know. So, uh, it, so it this was your first departure into Parkinson's. Although over the previous years you'd seen that there could be an application, there could be applications of these drugs in Parkinson's. The companies weren't particularly looking to do that; they were really around mood. And you could see that this was an opportunity, and that, and then that's why you set up your company. And and would you and would it be fair to say Neurolexis's primary focus? Is 5-HT in Parkinson's, or would you say it's more around these drugs working on selective receptors across the board? So, so what? So, so is your focus still remained in Parkinson's. Uh, so, our Parkinson's program is the most uh, prominent. It's the most uh, uh, advanced program that we have in Neurolexis. Neurolexis is actually is based on. Um, a platform of serotonin 5-HT1A compounds. Um, okay. so, 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 so that's the the value that we have as a company. So we have the, uh, we think, uh, the best 5-HT1A compounds that are uh, available today. Um, okay. And um, the most advanced of these compounds is the one that we are developing for Parkinson's disease. Okay. Um, so basically, but, if anyone found a problem with a 5-HT1A receptor or thought they needed something to, to act on that, you're the company to go to. They should uh, talk to us, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> OK. So so you, and what was it that you saw back in 2011 in Parkinson's and 5-HT and, and serotonin? So what was the what was the what did you put to the Michael J. Fox? Because obviously I could say, well, obviously in Parkinson's, forty percent of people have a degree of anxiety and depression. So, of course, I could see five HT systems would be quite useful for that. There was yeah. a little bit of story about five HT serotonin and tremor, whether that was causing the tremor of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you know, dyskinesias they're complicated when people get anxious and stressed. They get worsening dyskinesias. So, is that anything to do with five HT and dyskinesia? So, what was it that that you saw <clears throat> Parkinson's and the five HT and your and your platform that gave you sort of hope to develop yeah. something so, so so what um one of the things that really triggered interest in the parkinson's um was actually from the antipsychotics research i was doing okay um, because in the antipsychotics research uh one of the findings which people had been trying to figure out for a number of years was the fact that you can trigger pharmacologically um, what we call uh, catalepsy, which is kind of a, a rigidity. It's a, yeah. it's a movement impairment. Uh, and you can trigger that uh, by giving some of the very old antipsychotic drugs, which block dopamine receptors. Yeah. So, so, so this, is a, this is a neurological mechanism which has some echoes of what happens in Parkinson's disease. Yeah. If you if you give those dopamine receptor blockers, yeah. you actually uh, cause this catalepsy. You have this muscle rigidity, this slowed movement. Yeah. And what people had found was that if you give concurrently a 5-HT1A activator, 5-HT1A, we call them agonists, yeah. that you can reverse or rescue normal movement. 
So, so that implies that the so so the simple explanation would be if I give dopamine blocking drugs, I block all the dopamine receptors. You can't move because that's in Pugsy's you lose dopamine. But what you're saying is that can't be the simple answer because otherwise these drugs wouldn't work because the receptors are still blocked. Say so that the the Parkinsonian side effects from these drugs are mediated by this 5-HT system. That's that's the essence, is it, of what you're saying? That they are they are influenced by the 5-HT system. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so so that got got me interested in the Parkinson story. Yeah. Um, he said, "Well, th that's great for the antipsychotics if you can in develop antipsychotics which have this serotonin activity to oppose, you know, to, to rescue, um, you know, this catalepsy or which, which occurs. And you can see this in patients with with psychosis, with schizophrenia, uh, uh, and you can see this in the clinic." Um, so that's great, but why not apply that to Parkinson's as well? But the argument would be that if you could develop these 5-HT1 agonists, you should be able to make people better with their Parkinson's because it should switch on the dopamine system in some way and allow them to, to right. function better. So it's a and, sort of indirect way of stimulating the dopamine system in the regions that you need to move. That's exactly that's exactly right. And so... Uh, um, in, in fact, what's, what I then did in my research was uh, I started looking at uh, some of the anti-Parkinsonian drugs which are used uh, clinically. And if you do that, and then if you look at the activity at different receptors, um, you know, think of something like bromocryptine, for example. Okay. Okay. That's a very well, old dopamine agonist, that, that precedes rapinirol and pramipetrol. The, these are the older generation ones. If you look yeah. at pergolide or tergoride or lizaride, um, yeah. so, so these are some of these uh, so-called ergot um, compounds, yeah. um, but, but also a little bit uh, apomorphine, for example, okay. um, and also um, something like pyrimidel, which is a, a well, these are fairly old, but these yeah. these drugs have some serotonin activity in them, okay. uh, 5-HT1A activity. Okay. So, uh, so at that stage, I was thinking, well, look, there, there's reasons to be interested in 5-HT1A in Parkinson's. Um, so, so then, when uh, when we created Neuralixis, we thought, well, we should go for this. this there's a story there. Um, okay. let, let's so, go off. So then, so you, so in the company, having got this grant from the Fox, you you then started to manufacture these sort of synthetic re receptor agonists, which you would then use in animal models. Or, or uh, how, yes, I mean, yeah. I, it's just interesting because it's not an area I work in. In in in. So how do you take your sort of concept of I think this receptor is good in Parkinson's to actually test it before you go to your clinical trial? So, so what sort of work do you do in the company to sort of try and support so, your theory? Yeah, so um, so the compound, the lead compound we're working on, actually was um, previously worked at worked on by Pierre Fabre, where I had been a director of uh, neurobiology and. Um, and the company had decided not to develop that drug um, further. So we were able to license that drug into Neurolixis. And so then what we did was we ran that compound through a series of uh, animal models. So okay. rat studies using Parkinsonian rats. Okay. And uh, we tested the compound in, uh, um, in in marmosets, so in Parkinsonian marmosets or Parkinsonian. So these are rats and 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 sort of uh, monkeys where you've knocked out part of the dopamine system, so they so they have the primary pathology of Parkinson's, and then you're trying to rectify it and make it better with your drug. That would be the sort of that, that's correct. So 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 in these animal models, what you do is you you administer um, a, a, a toxin. Yeah. Which will uh, lesion or destroy certain dopamine neurons in particular parts of the brain, uh, and, and that's uh, it, it. Kind of mimics some aspects of Parkinson's disease, okay. um, and and if you do that in these uh, rats or these monkeys, and you then give the compound which we've been developing, we, we, it's a compound we call NLX one one two, and yeah. if you give that compound, then what you see is that you actually uh, rescue to some extent, normal motor behavior of these animals. Um, and uh, so, so this, this took a certain number of years. We, we built up from, we started at, uh, at the bottom end, let's say, with, with, with a rat model, and then we went to 
and these marmosets and then into macaques. And then, of course, the next thing was getting into the clinic and actually seeing if that translated to, um, you know, into a clinical trial. And and, you, the, and the company which you'd got it from, they had never developed it to the point of trying it in people. They had only they'd only be doing it in the lab, so they hadn't tried it in anxiety or depression. And in, in, uh, yeah, the, the company actually, it, actually, yes, they had. Uh, so the company I was with uh, yeah. previously yeah. had um, carried out the clinical trial. In the, the, they were interested in chronic pain. Okay, that, that was that was the original indication. Uh, it didn't work very well, um, so they stopped the program. Um, but you, but then at least you knew when you came to having done your preclinical testing in the Parkinsonian models that when you came to try it in in people, they already had some data on its tolerability, how well it was, you know, tolerated by people taking it. it absolutely. So so we already had um, information on about yeah. six hundred people. Um, okay. So it had already been administered at different doses and different durations. So we knew it was safe. Yeah. We knew it was uh, well tolerated. Uh, but it had never been tested in Parkinson's disease patients. So, so, so there was a you know a new step which had to be obviously planned very carefully. So, Adrian, when did that when did that happen? When did you start your first trial in in people with Parkinson's with this drug? Yeah. So, um, so this was uh, started in right at the end of. Uh, um, let me get this right. I think it was right at the end of twenty twenty. Um, okay. um, I'm sorry, I'm 2020. It's pre-COVID, post-COVID. No, 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 it, it was 2021. Sorry, uh, just getting the dates right. Yeah, it was okay. the, 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 the COVID story. The, the kind of, um, um, yeah, the, the, the COVID did slow things down a bit. Okay, uh, it, it, it wasn't comfortable. But um, but we worked with a team in Sweden. There was five clinical sites in Sweden, and uh, they handled it very well, frankly. Um between end of 21 and beginning of 23, uh, we were able to recruit all the patients and, and complete the whole, uh, the whole study. And so how big was this study? Yeah, so, so this was um, it's what we call a phase 2A. So phase okay. 2A basically means that um, it's the first trial in the target patient population. Right? Okay. Uh, it wasn't very big. We we're looking at uh, 20... Uh, two patients who fully completed the trial according to the protocol. Um, and so, so it's uh, it's what we call a proof of concept trial. Um, yeah. To it, it basically a demonstration that it can work. That, that's okay. what we were looking to do. So the previous company had shown it was sort of safe, tolerated, and therefore it, you could you could develop. So people weren't becoming profoundly unwell with it. And now, having shown that it was safe and well tolerated, if you like, you want to say, well, does it do anything? Because I've got to get a signal of effect. Because if it's doing absolutely nothing, there's probably not much merit in this. And so, and so, this trial was successful in the sense that it was tolerated, and you saw some signal of it, of a sort of proof of concept it was working. So, how exactly does it work? So, we've talked about the fact that it it binds to this receptor. So, is it by is it that it, by activating the, this particular receptor and this five HT network? that sort of bypasses the dopamine problems. And so some of the movement aspects, movement disorder aspects, Parkinson's are driven by abnormalities in the 5-HT system, or does it bind to this 5-HT receptor and somehow modulate the dopamine network? And that's what makes people better. What, what's so, the exact mechanism? But that's a really good question. The, I think the answer is, is twofold. Um, so, so firstly, yes, it does modulate the levels of dopamine in the brain. Uh, particularly following uh, levodopa uh, dosing. So, of course, of course, we know that um, levodopa is the gold standard treatment um, for treating yeah. um, motor um, disability in, uh, in Parkinson's. And, um, but we also know that as the disease progresses, uh, levodopa can cause uh, these motor fluctuations that we call dyskinesias. Yeah. And... Um, and what, what has been shown um, over the last few years in a number of different models, in animal models, but also in the clinic, is that those motor fluctuations are due to this levodopa being taken up into serotonin neurons and not just into dopamine neurons. So okay. the serotonin neurons can take up the levodopa. They have the cellular machinery to convert it to dopamine. 
Um, okay. But they don't have the cellular machinery necessary to release it in a normal physiological manner. So, so, so w- w- what happens is that the um, the levodopa gets taken up into serotonin neurons. They convert yeah. the dopamine, and then it kind of splurge it out. And you dopamine know, neurons normally have this transporter, so once you've released it, you can grab it and bring it back in, so you can inactivate right. it. Presumably, the five HD it releases dopamine and then says goodbye. I can't. I'm, there's nothing I can do. With oh, right. It. There's no control mechanism to sort of steady the okay. whole process. Okay. Um, so, um, so, so that's to answer your question. Uh, yes, there is an effect of serotonin neurons uh, on dopamine levels um, from okay. the levodopa. Um, and, then, and so your receptor then binds to the binds to those serotonin neurons and stops them releasing dopamine. Is that the idea? Is it the yes, yeah, so, so, right. So, so the drug, uh, you know, this activator, this uh, this agonist, will bind to the receptor, which is on the serotonin neurons, yeah. trigger um, a cascade of effects in the cell, which will slow down those serotonin neurons. So it'll it'll okay. slow down this splurge of dopamine being released from the levodopa. Uh, and, and by you know, dampening this um, this surge, uh, therefore you prevent these motor fluctuations, which we call dyskinesias. Okay. So the idea would be the L-dopa carries on working. One of the problems with it, these 5-HT neurons take it up, release it in an uncontrolled way, and your drug okay. then takes out the 5-HT component of that and says... Yep. You can just have the dopamine system working on its own without this complication of 5-HT. And so and so the net effect in patients will be that the motor fluctuations disappear because you would have a more steady state of L-dopresent. Yes, yes, that, that's correct. I, I wouldn't say that we're, we're shutting down the serotonin neurons completely, uh, but okay. it, it's, it's more to do with dampening it and, and so, so, so that the, um, the dopamine is not released in this big surge, but more as a kind of, ongoing steady stream so, so, they and, 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 yeah. so they don't get depression or anything as a consequence of this because obviously if, if you're sort of if you're making those cells less active you could be changing the levels of 5-HT that are also released and therefore the 5-HT may drop and that may be a bad thing in terms of that, that's, a, that's a really good comment and and this is where the story I think um, has another really uh, exciting aspect to it because um as as we were talking about a few minutes ago, if you target 5-HT1A receptors, particularly in these frontal cortex part of the brain, um, if you activate those receptors in the brain region, you're actually antidepressant. So, so if you're giving a serotonin 5-HT1A agonist, you can hope to have two beneficial effects. One is... Uh, preventing this non-physiological dopamine release from levodopa. And the other one is maybe also uh, having some sort of mood benefit on on depression symptoms. Um, So uh, so, so the two uh, is kind of uh, uh, complementary and beneficial. So it's treating motor and non-motor aspects of Parkinson's with one agent. That's that's what we're hoping. Uh, So motor symptoms and potentially non-motor symptoms. Um, So... uh, uh, that, that would in be your with... trial, in your trial, what was the major thing you saw? I mean, obviously you say, well, actually it was it was encouraging because we got proof of concept. So what was the co- what was it that you, that that trial showed? I know it's in small numbers of patients, yeah. but what was the key finding from it, which has given you confidence to take it on? Because then we're going to discuss about you know what you're going to do next. Right. So so we were primarily uh, the, the the primary outcome was uh, safety and tolerability. Yeah. So. We had to establish first and foremost that um, this drug is safe and well tolerated in that patient population. You know, yeah. we'd beat it to other patient populations, but not in Parkinson's. So we had to be yeah. clear about that. Uh, uh, and, and then that was fine. Um, yeah. the, the next thing was um, we wanted to show that the compound could control the dyskinesias and uh, triggered by levodopa. Yeah. And, and that was the case too. Uh, it was very clearly uh, significant. Now, uh, this was one of the happy findings from the study mm-hmm. was that even though the patient numbers were small, yeah. Um, yeah. the effect of the drug was very clear cut and very highly statistically significant. Um, and, it so, so get, it, and it got rid of the dyskinesis, but it didn't make people very um, Parkinsonian, if you like, because you, you could, of course, then 
if you stop this extra <laughs> release of dopamine, you get rid of dyskinesias and you get rid of the some of the benefits of L-dope. So people become rather slow and and bradykinetic and such like. But you didn't see that. It was it was rather selective for the dyskinesias. No, well, in fact, it, you you made a very good point because um, what what you've just described was in fact the case with some old serotonin compounds which people have tried in the past. Um, so they would take down the dyskinesias, but at the price of interfering with normal um, motor uh, coordination. Uh, now, that was not the case with our drug. In fact, it went the other way. And we took down the dyskinesias, but we also improved um, motor symptoms, um, the primary motor disability. And um, th 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 that was a, a great bonus finding. It wasn't our primary uh, objective, but uh, uh, we observed that, in fact, it, it was a a dual therapeutic by property. Dyskinesias came down and the motor disability also came down, the Parkinsonism itself. Um, how did that happen? So what drives that? Th that's a really good question. Uh, I I have some hypotheses. Okay, yeah. so a very simple hypo hypothesis would be that by dampening the dopamine release uh, appropriately from the serotonin neurons, maybe we're boosting the anti-Parkinsonian anti effect, um, just just by stabilizing the dopamine levels. So, so, so that's a very, let's say, simple level um, hypothesis. And another hypothesis is that, um, in fact, the compound may be acting in particular brain regions which are controlling uh, uh, motor coordination. And I'm thinking in the straight or brain region. Um, and uh, there are 5-HT1A receptors in the brain region, but they're not very well characterized. Yeah. Um, so, so at this stage, we think, well, we should go and investigate that more closely um, because th that could be an additional brain region, which is important, in addition to the cortex, which we mentioned for yeah. anxiety, depression, in, in addition to the RAFA, which is important for these dyskinesias. And maybe there's this third brain region, which is also important for uh, other aspects of, uh, of movement. So this drug could have a primary, it could be used primarily in Parkinson's. So, so, I mean, the starting concept was it would have to be given in the context of people already on Madapas, their L-DOPA medication, because it's dampening down this kinesias. But you're saying, actually, if this all pans out, it could be first-line treatment. It could be, a, it could, you could use it earlier because it's got a primary anti-Parkinsonian effect. As well, as, as correct. And uh, one of the um, observations in the clinical trial was that the, the size of that anti-Parkinsonian effect Yeah was in the same range in, in in terms of the clinical rating scales was in the same range as what you see with with the dopamine agonist such such as a rapinirol or robotigotine so yeah. uh so if this is confirmed in uh, future um clinical trials then yes may, maybe this is something you could you could go in with to start with as opposed to um just sticking with this dopamine replacement theory or you know principle which has been really the um, the foundation stone of a therapy for, for so many years now. Well, I can see that's quite attractive because you could start it, you get a symptomatic benefit. It also is going to protect people from getting dyskinesia. So actually, right. it, it, it it's not just improving the Pugsies, it will prevent one of the major complications which comes with it. Yeah. So, so where are you going to go next, Adrian, with this? So obviously this has been encouraging. You've got this very small study. You show it's feasible. You've got two benefits. One is it seems to be good at getting rid of dusk uneasiness. Secondly, it has an anti-Parkinsonian effect in its own right. So this sounds pretty good. And obviously, it, by working on the system, it may have benefits which we've yet to see in mood and sleep and other aspects, which may be independent of any major control. So what's what's the next phase? What's the next trial you're going to do? Yeah, so, I, so, so this is, we're at this exciting point in the story where, um, there's a number of different possibilities which are open. And uh, um, so th the intention is uh, to stick with LID, so L-DOPA-induced dyskinesia, okay. uh, as being the primary indication. That's, that's where we want to, um, we want to go. Uh, we, we want to stay with that because it's the best characterized in terms of the mechanisms, best characterized in terms of the, um, the neurophysiology, but also of how the drug works. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of validation. So the um, what we've shown in the phase two... And there's also a, not much to do in that area, is there? I mean, you know, someone who sees a lot of people with Parkinson's, 
I mean, if they develop dyskinesias, you can obviously fiddle with the medication and then you can give them a mantadine. And if they don't get on with a mantadine or it doesn't work, you're really looking at quite invasive therapies with deep brain stimulation. We don't right. have any other oral agents we can use for dyskinesias once no. if we can't get on with a the mantadine. There's a real medical need there, uh, yeah. which is why, of course, um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation and then I should mention Parkinson's UK have yeah. been very committed to this. Um, I, I, should, I didn't say it earlier, but both of those foundations uh, co-funded the clinical trial. Okay. Um, so, so, so this was, um, you know, both of those foundations have basically been highly supportive of everything that I've been describing of, you know, during our conversation, um, and, and they, and they find us the clinical trial. And that's because they know that there is a medical need there. And they think that this mechanism can answer that. So the, um, the intention is to stick with LID, um, yeah. the phase 2A demonstrates that it that the drug can work. We know it can work because we've shown it. Um, yeah. What we need, now need to do is to show that it can work on a uh, larger scale. We need to have, it, it's, it's what we would call a phase 2B. Um, so, so this is, um, this is this will be a trial where you, instead of 20, 25 patients, you would go to maybe 200. Um, okay. And um, uh, there would be an international trial. There would be, um, longer duration because this trial that we carried out was only uh, over um, was over eight weeks, so okay. uh, it was it was very brief. Um, so we would want to do something longer. We would want yeah. to do something with more patients, and we would probably want to go to higher doses as well um, okay. because it's safe and it's well tolerated. So so why not take the doses higher? Maybe we'll have an even more favorable. So would responses. it be? So would you have different doses? So would there be a dose escalation in that trial, or would you just say I'm going to go for a slightly higher dose, one dose? And presumably you'll have a placebo arm. So of the 200 patients, let's say you put in the trial, would it be sort of 150 on active treatment, 50 on placebo, or or 100? Yeah. So 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 typically typically what you would do is uh, you would have. Um, what we what we would call a three arm or a four arm trial. So we, yeah. you would have a placebo arm, which would yeah. mean a, a group of patients would be on placebo um, as a kind of control group, and then you would have, for example, two or three doses of um, of drug, um, yeah. um, one three or four arms, two well three or four in total uh, yeah. as um, in the trial, and. Um, there's different ways of doing this. You, you could sort of titrate up the dose. I mean, gradually increase the dose until you hit your target dose. Yeah. Um, that's what we did in the previous trial. Um, it, it works pretty well because um, it gives you time to see if there's anything amiss. Um, it gives you time to adjust if if you want to sort of change things around a bit. Um, so, so, so that's a pretty attractive way of doing it. And, and it's so also you basically something... randomize people to four arms and then you'd start so one arm would be on placebo the other three arms would all start on one dose and then you would slowly push up two of them to higher doses is that right yeah yes it, that pretty much is it and uh, um uh, given how well tolerated it is we think that that would be that would work pretty well um, and then you'd run that trial for how long like six months would that be a reasonable time or... well uh, i i think we'd be going to uh, to three months probably. Um, so what I should say, because in the last trial, we we scaled up the dose very gradually over four weeks. Then we only had two weeks at a stable top dose, okay. and then we scaled down again. So yeah. the, the, it's the top dose plateau which is which is key. Yeah. Um, so we would like instead of two weeks, we would like that to be probably six or eight weeks. Um, okay. And then when you add in the scaling, that it takes you to about three months altogether. That, that, that would be a pretty good trial to run. And so that trial, if you were to start that, when would that be completed? And, and I suppose what people will be interested in is, you know, the phase three study, which will be the next sort of big trial, which would be the one that would give it its market, I guess, if, if you proved mm -hmm. it with a phase three study. I guess the regulators would say, assuming you've done it in the way we like, we can we can we will take that to, to market now or you could take it to market we'll approve it yeah so, so, so what's so the, the sort of timelines because everyone says five years that's what everyone says in answer to the question on time <laughs> but it, yeah the, 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 this is uh, this whole process uh, you know if we run a phase 2b um 
we're hoping to start that um, in 2024. Okay. Um, okay. Um, but you have that to. That would be international. So that would be Europe and America. So, yeah. That isn't defined right now. Okay. Um, uh, that depends on a lot of different um, planning uh, factors, but it would certainly be uh, international. Okay. Um, so the uh, timeline for that, well, you, you have to count a couple of years at least. Um, okay. and, and then you would run a phase three. So the phase three is what we call a pivotal trial, which is, uh, as, as you as you said, the, is, the results from that would be what would determine the approval of the drug, we hope, um, by the regulators for for commercial use, which would make it available to patients. Um, so between the phase two, B, the phase three, and then you have to allow up to a year for the um, for the regulators to review it. You're looking at yeah, you're looking five six years. Um, so if it went well, um, the target date, which I like to think of, is 2030. Um, as, as being um, approval and making that available to to the PD community. Okay, we're, we're sort of coming towards the end because we're sort of running out of time. But I, I'm just interested in so your primary endpoint in these trials will be motor aspects, the dyskinesias you're saying. Um, how much attention will you pay to looking at people's mood? Uh, how much will you look at sleep? Because obviously these serotonin. I mean, I don't know enough about these receptors. We've already said these receptors could be modulating mood in the front or label. So, so will that be an important part of your trials? We'll be looking at that. So, look, I would really like that to be the case. Now, the, the um, in the previous trial, the um, patients had very low basal starting scores of yeah, yeah. anxiety and depression. They they weren't selected. Uh, they weren't recruited into the trial. For those reasons, they were recruited because they had troublesome uh, dyskinesia. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was a bit of a kind of a sideline observation. And frankly, because they had low scores to start with, there wasn't much to improve. And yeah. um, now, in, in a much bigger trial, let, let's say there were 200 patients in a bigger trial, then you could hope that amongst those patients, there would also be sufficient numbers of. Um, patients that could potentially also suffer from other uh, non-motor symptoms like uh, depression, like sleep um, dysfunction, like chronic pain. Uh, and you could then maybe have some indication that the drug could be active on those symptoms as well. Um, but but it, it also, it's all to do with inclusion criteria and on what basis are you recruiting the patients to, to start with. Okay. So we just got a couple of uh, quick, uh, just to finish, with, uh, someone was wanting to know if... Um... How do people with Parkinson's accelerate the timeline? Why is it taking you so long? And then, and then there's this question about dopamine reuptake inhibitors. Are they, you know, what do we know about those? So, so I, the, I know we've only got about a minute left, but I, okay, why is it responsive? taking so long? Uh, it takes a long time because the regulators require certain levels of testing, and, and this is for safety reasons. It's to protect the patients ultimately. Um, you have to run the trials for certain durations. You have to have certain numbers of, of patients. You have to run them in the certain condition, conditions. And this is to make sure that the drugs that get to market have been properly validated. Um, so that's why it takes so long. Uh, the, the other reason was, um, the other question was, oh, yeah. Uh, dopamine, whether whether a, you could block a dopamine transporter, for example. Okay. Um, interesting. Yes, they could be beneficial, but um, the problem there is that the dopamine reuptake inhibitors work on dopamine uh, neurons, and the dopamine neurons are dying. So, uh, so you're losing the effect there because you haven't. You're losing your target essentially. Yeah. Well, we must draw it to an end there, Adrian. This has been a fascinating uh, conversation, taking you from uh, this system in in uh, mood disturbances, in pain. And, you know, we want to congratulate you on seeing how this could help people with Parkinson's and taking it forward with your company and the very exciting data that you've uh, shared with us today. So we're very grateful for that and the way in which you've explained it in a, in a very accessible way. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for that. I want to thank our sponsors, Supernus Pharmaceuticals and Mitsubishi Tanabe. Farmer America for supporting not only this one, but the ones which are coming up and indeed our next research spotlight, 
uh, I'll have to look at my paper to get it right, is on Tuesday, April the 23rd, which, if I remember correctly, is William Shakespeare's birthday and William Shakespeare's death day. Uh, and that will be at 11 a.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time with uh, Laura Volpicelli uh, daily. Uh, he'll be talking on a research on alpha synuclein uh, and what that does in Parkinson's disease. So put that in your diary. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you again, Adrian.